now more than ever, innovative technologies are fueling change and sparking new ways of thinking. Collaboration between corporations and startups is key to staying at the forefront of these trends. However, finding the right startups can be expensive, time-consuming, and ineffective. But Plug and Play is here to help. As a corporate partner, you will gain access to a whole ecosystem of innovation. Discover startups that meet your tech interests. Stay updated on the latest trends and network with industry peers. We will help you during every stage of your innovation journey, no matter where you are and where you want to go. Get in touch today. Hi everyone, thank you for joining us today. My name is Akadina Yadigar. I am the Senior Program Manager for the Brand and Retail Vertical here at Plug and Play. And I am very excited to welcome you to the official launch of the Sustainable Fashion Innovation Platform. Our goal for today is to bring together industry experts, those working at the forefront of innovation in this space, and to start a dialogue. Hopefully we'll do more than just start a dialogue as we move forward and build these connections. I will be guiding you through today's event for the next hour and a half. We are so excited to have you here and we have a really great lineup of speakers and startups for you today. As far as the agenda, we'll just start with a quick plug and play overview. Um, then we'll follow that by going into a fireside chat with Christine Goulet from Pangaea, um, moderated by Danae Robert on the plug and play side. Next, we'll be bouncing back and forth between startup pitches and the startup value chain journey led by Danae Robert and Alexandra Pine. Um, and with that, um, we can jump right in. So for those of you that don't know, the plug and play mission is to drive innovation by connecting entrepreneurs, corporations, and investors worldwide. We do that through our accelerator programs, which we run globally and constantly throughout the year, um, corporate innovation through our partnerships with large enterprise companies, and venture capital. Here are some of our global industry-specific verticals. Today is a collaboration between brand and retail and sustainability. These programs bring together our corporate partners and startups. And if we zoom in on those two main industries, we can take a look at some of our most recent focus areas, including ending plastic waste, carbon neutrality, e-commerce enablement, data analytics and operations, consumer touch points, and of course, fashion. We can help build your global reach with our worldwide offices and access to the best startups and the highest level of corporations around the world. And finally, please meet the team. You'll hear from some of us today, but we have a great big team ready to support you in any way. Please feel free to reach out to me or any one of us after the event. And again, we are so excited to have you here. And without further ado, I would love to introduce to you the Fireside Chat we have Christine Goulet, the Global Director of B2B Sales at Pangaea, which will be moderated by Danae Ropper, our Ventures Associate on the Plug and Play side. Um, please feel free to turn on your cameras and microphones and Danae, please take it away. Thank you so much, Akadina. Hi, Christine, how are you? Hi, great, happy to be here. Same here, thank you so much for the time. I really appreciate sure. it. Um, maybe let's start right away. Christine, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, happily. So um, yeah, Christine Goulet, I joined Pangaea a few months ago to launch the, the B2B business, which we'll be talking about a bit today in terms of innovation, how we're working with startups, etc. Previously, I was at the Caring Group for almost six years in the sustainability department at the Paris headquarters. And uh, at the beginning, I was focused on sustainable sourcing. And then the last few years, I was focused on innovation. So very much looking across the value chain, um, working with startups, working with other brands and, and partners on uh, trying to understand how to, how to really move these um, great technologies through the, the, the funnel, the innovation funnel. So. Thank you. Um, and maybe just a little bit about myself. Uh, my name is Danae. I'm a venture associate at Plug and Play, working in new materials, packaging, and sustainability. Um, I have a scientific background. I focused on chemistry throughout my education, ended up doing a master in green chemistry, energy, and the environment in London, where I researched the recycling of polycotton. 
uh, I decided to step away from the lab and work in the investment space uh, where my background is definitely very useful. Um, Christine, so Pengaya has a B2B and B2C play, so business to business and direct to consumer. Could you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, happily. So many of you might be aware of the direct to consumer brand. It's uh, very young still, just a, a couple years out on the market, but has definitely resonated with consumers. Um, uh, it's focused on sort of the intersection of material science, design, innovation, sustainability, and looking to inspire and accelerate an earth positive future by, by putting these material science innovations forward. And so I'm actually wearing, of course, one of our Pengai shirts and you can see with the text block, that's really one of the signatures which states very transparently what is in the product, how it was you know, made in terms of the material or the treatment, et cetera. Uh, so as I quickly mentioned during the intro, uh, I've been uh, working the last few months on the B2B side, which we're calling Pangaea Science. It's a very rich part of the business with different revenue streams. And here, you know, it's with accelerating an earth positive future, the purpose of the B2B is really to try to help disseminate these material science innovations at scale by working with other brands and suppliers on how they can adopt that. So what we're creating is this concierge service uh, where we can deliver, no pun intended, but a plug and play solution to others um, to be able to pick up these innovations. Um, so within Pangaea, we have an R&D team of, oh, I think it's over 10 people now. You know, a lot of them are scientists, material engineers, textile engineers, ex Lululemon, ex Adidas, ex Burberry. So they've been inside companies and they understand what these innovations are all about in the technologies and how they fit specifically in uh, the apparel world. We also have an impact team that's able to verify um, the, the technologies we're seeing in terms of sustainability. We also have partners, external partnerships with R&D centers, um, academic institutions, fabric mills, spinners, so that we can work quite closely, our internal teams with our external partners to try to um, do the work needed and the legwork needed to get these innovations to a place where they can be adopted. So that's, you know, we, we don't just wanna be a technology provider, but a solution provider where we're putting the pieces of the puzzle together so that it's easier for other brands to, to adopt the materials because the testing has been done, the vetting in terms of impact, um, you know, the, um, uh, the work to get a uh, fabric blend to the right place where it feels really great and you can't necessarily feel that there's a, a banana fiber or a nettle fiber, which historically has been quite um, rough in terms of hand touch. So we can offer this library of innovative fabrics. We have over 200 fabrics that we've developed with our uh, fabric mill partners, both in denim and in knits. Um, we have Hero Technologies. Uh, Flower Down is one that some of you might have heard of. So that's a, a down insulation alternative that is uh, non-animal based and non-petroleum based. So it's made from native um, uh, flowers from native prairie lands which don't use artificial irrigation, don't use pesticides, and actually help preserve a species of butterflies. And this combined with PLA is able to create a very um, uh, soft, uh, loose fill fiber that can replace um, your, your goose down or your synthetic down alternatives. So this one example, we have other technologies like the peppermint um, antimicrobial treatment. We have different dyes, et cetera. So really trying to build out this portfolio of innovations that become part of Pangaea Science and work closely uh, with brands and, and suppliers to, um, to adopt these and implement them. Thank you so much. So that's a lot of things. And I know you are working with startups. How do you engage with them usually? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, we are, are very flexible <laughs> in working with startups. So in some cases, we might invest directly in the startup. So one example of that is with Kintra, who uh, is uh, based in, in New York. They're doing a bio-based, biodegradable, um, synthetic fiber alternative. So we have done a direct investment into their startup. Uh, in other cases, we might help sort of on the sales and marketing side. Uh, we know that a lot of startups are uh, maybe resource constrained or looking 
at various sectors, fashion being one, but maybe they're also looking at automotive or um, uh, furniture, et cetera. So having a, an expertise um, in fashion, we can help startups in preparing, you know, all the testing needed or all the communication materials needed um, to, to enter the fashion market and meet the brands and, and do that business development. Uh, in other cases, we are partnering, as I mentioned, with research centers or academic institutions where we work on a co-development of the IP itself or even with startups, with JDAs. So, so it's very broad. Um, you know, our purpose really is to uh, try to help provide the, the resources needed to get these technologies we really believe in out uh, as quickly as possible to the market and uh, to others. Yeah, super interesting. So when it comes to innovation, do you feel like there's a sector that lacks attention and investment? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I think fashion overall, there, there's been a lot of discussion over the last few years about how it's been historically underinvested compared to other sectors. You know, if you look at like pharmaceuticals or cosmetics, you know, historically, they've been um, putting two to three percent of their their revenue back into R&D. Um, so there's been an, an investment overall in, uh, um, in innovation in, in other sectors. Fashion, you know, I think uh, the way people are making clothes now is very similar to the way they're making clothes, you know, 50 years ago in general. Um, I know I talk with a lot of investors now that we are seeing sort of this boom um, in sustainable fashion innovation, you know, with this convergence with biotech and different uh, materials in particular. Uh, I think there's a lot that can be done in cross-fertilizing the knowledge within the fashion sector with investors who haven't been working in this space to try to see how to bridge those gaps. And I think in, in terms of sustainable fashion innovation, you know, we have seen a lot of pockets of activity uh, with the materials and a lot also with end of life. So those two parts of the value chain, I think this is great because if you look at where does the impact lie, you know, it often is at that raw material sourcing stage of the natural resources. And of course, the end of life, if we're able to move from a linear to circular system, we're able to reduce the amount that we're going back to the virgin resources. So, so these are really great areas to be focused on. And I also think there's a lot of uh, focus around areas that will resonate with consumers um, be because we want to drive that demand where I think we can do more, and, and there's definitely a lot happening, but it, I think there's more that can be done is in the middle part of the value chain when it comes to the processing and especially how we're making the clothes, like the on-demand, the customization. You know, I think brands are very conscious of the overproduction issue and excess inventory and, and how do we reduce this, this problem. But a lot of uh, the solutions are focused more on the symptoms of the problem and working with the suppliers on um, the, the, the production piece is, is something that, um, again, there's, there's activity, but we maybe need a bigger push there. That's it's harder so because it's, you know, we don't always have leverage as a brand um, to work with suppliers on, on those sort of innovations. And they, they take a lot of um, potential capital infrastructure investment to, to change the way things are done. Yeah, and I'm glad you say that. We're going to dive a little bit deeper into that uh, part of the value chain of the textile. So I do think that um, there needs to be more focus on the entire circularity of things uh, rather than, you know, just feedstock and, and uh, end of life, even though it is important. I think it's a global um, mm -hmm. partnership that, that needs to be done there. And in general, so you said you have 200 um, fabrics right now. There is a lot of controversies today on how much more sustainable these new products and textiles are. Mm -hmm. How do you compare all these different fabrics and processes? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's a great question. You know, I think um, so many brands right now and other organizations, you know, um, uh, NGOs and experts were, were trying to crack the nut on what's the best way to measure impact. Um, so obviously there are LCAs and internally within um, Pengaya, we're working with a third party to do LCAs of our hero technologies and um, many of, of the innovative fibers that we're using um, in fabrics. 
the fabrics that we've developed with particularly innovative fibers to really understand what it means in terms of, of impact, um, because it is key that, that you measure to make sure you're, you're moving in the right direction. Um, one thing that everybody realizes, I think, as well is with innovations, if they're very early stage, LCAs become difficult to do because if the, the technology is still at lab stage and you don't know how it's going to scale up, it's maybe premature to go into a full, full LCA to measure the impact. So that's when um, you need to rely on, on, on um, well, there's always some modeling, obviously, but, but more modeling uh, and, and have a, an approach where the um, data that you're requiring or looking at from an innovator is linked with the TRL level of the innovation. Um, and there is the, the report that uh, Biofabricate and Fashion for Good have done that was released uh, last December, uh, which is a primer for the fashion industry on these materials, which has a section on impact, which I think is quite helpful as well in sort of seeing how you can think about impact and data through the, the life cycle of, a, of an innovation or technology. And so what are the risks in these collaborations, if, if any? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, with innovation, there's risk. And I think that's one of the exciting parts and one of the places where everyone has to understand that there's going to be risk, more risk than you're used to and embrace it in a way, because otherwise we're not going to make any change. Um, but yeah, what are, the, what are the risks? The risks are that you put time in or money in and the technology doesn't work the way that you want it to, um, or that, uh, you know, the price will be very high and no one will want to adopt it and you won't be able to achieve economies of scale uh, and get that price lower. Um, that, you know, I think one risk is, or one challenge is that people compare the innovative materials uh, and processes um, to what currently exists without necessarily um, trying to change the paradigm to account for the fact that it is an innovation. So yeah, no, I think, I think uh, there are a number of risks. I, I think uh, happily working together with um, startups, with like plug and play, all the knowledge that you guys have around the startup process across different verticals, you know, there's still a lot of learning that can be passed on and that can be shared. So that even if it's a technology that no one has seen before, it, we still understand what the process would need to be and how to minimize those, the challenges and risks that might come up. So, um, so yeah, there, there's still some roadmaps that you can kind of look to. And I think that's one of the things that you guys have at, at Plug and Play is this, this uh, deep experience and, and knowledge of, of that piece too, to help guide uh, brands or others and startups as they're growing. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it becomes also a problem of the properties that you're trying to match together. And that's something we're also going to talk a little bit later as well. Okay. Um, and the fashion industry has lately been looking at waste also from different markets for their own feedstock. What do you think about that collaboration between different markets? Um, is your company looking at that at all? Yeah, yeah, for sure. No, I mean, the feedstock issue is, is uh, front and center, like top of mind, I think, for for everybody right now. Um, and it's not just in fashion, it's across any, any materials that we're looking at these different feedstock generations and, and what, it, what it means in terms of risks. Um, you know, I know that part of what we wanna focus on today is the collaboration aspect and we can constantly learn from other sectors um, and um, verticals that might be more advanced than, than fashion in the innovation space. You know, as I was saying in the beginning, Fashion has historically been sort of under underinvested, so for sure we need to look outside of our our own lane and see what uh, others have done, um, and continue to you know map the the current status of of different feedstocks, the second and third generation feedstocks. You know, continue to support innovators who are working on fourth generation feedstocks and and build the uh, supply on that side and. Yeah, there is quite a lot of, of focus on this topic. So a lot of activity there. I think the, the Loudest Foundation actually published a report, just published a report mapping out agri-waste, for example, to try to understand um, which, uh, 
uh, which sort of existing agro-waste feedstocks would be applicable to which types of materials. So yeah, luckily there's, there is a, a, a lot happening and a lot of collaboration, I think already um, that we need to continue. Definitely. And so based on, on what you're saying on collaborations, uh, even between corporations, um, he has been very competitive in the past. And mm -hmm. lately, there has been a change and we would see a lot more corporate uh, collaboration in the aim to be more sustainable. Do you have any advice on how we could promote that even more? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think around, you know, I've been working in sustainability for many years and there's always this like cooperation feel around sustainability um, because brands do want to cooperate, but there's still some competitive advantage there in, in being a first mover or having a certain technology. So I think um, definitely these open innovation platforms where you're getting uh, different companies from the same sector to come together is very powerful in terms of collaboration and being able to identify which uh, technologies have the most promise and helping to support those innovators in, in that space. I think we've seen a lot also around sort of the consortium models uh, where uh, innovations are sort of um, divided up in terms of field of use or in terms of segment, you know, whether it be automobile, fashion, um, uh, et cetera, or ready to wear accessories, et cetera, or, you know, there, there are ways of being able to carve out space for multiple brands to be able to work with a certain technology or innovation, uh, which won't put them head to head and still allow a lot on the uh, uh, acceleration piece because it, it enables the innovator to be directly in touch with certain market segments and understand very clearly what the specifications are for certain applications and really informs the R&D process for those technologies uh, much more quickly while giving the, the brands as well access to the materials for, for a certain product or, or segment. So I think that's um, a formula that everybody's seen uh, growing over the last few years and, and one that, that's uh, very powerful in that respect. Mm -hmm. That's very interesting. We actually do that a lot uh, right now in the plastic waste. We work with the Alliance to End Plastic Waste. And so therefore, there are a lot of people interested in the topic from brands to recyclers and connecting everyone together on one project has very um, has had great um, impact in general. So I would love to do that also in sustainable fashion here. Yeah. And so you also worked in a large group what are the main differences in approach that you saw working in a large corporation versus a smaller one? Mm -hmm. uh, no, it's a, it's a great question. I mean, I think one of the things that makes Pengai special is this agility and this focus, this focus on material sciences innovation, um, this uh, directment, direction, directing investment and resources to this topic um, to allow these sort of quick uh, launches to market with, with new materials um, and new technologies. Uh, and I think with uh, other companies, bigger brands, there might not be as much of a focus, you know, resources are going into, into many different um, areas. And I think, you know, going back to the idea of risk and what risk means, I, that's one of the main issues. So uh, a smaller company might be more willing to take that risk and say, we're, we're going out, we're gonna see what happens. Um, use more of that design thinking approach of, of testing and iterating. Um, larger companies might have more processes internally in terms of testing requirements. Um, you know, there has to be some change management, I believe, uh, on through different functions that touch upon getting a product or a new process off the ground on uh, accepting more risk, probably. If, if we wanna move the needle on innovation because um, the technologies that you're working with are not going to be one-to-one -one replacements in many cases for whatever you're currently using. So you have to see where are you willing to um, make trade-offs or to say, okay, we can compromise uh, because we still think it's quite important to get this out. Um, so I think those are a few areas where, where there's a difference between a larger company and a, and a smaller, more agile one. 
Definitely. And so maybe for my next question, your answer is going to be risk as well. But what are the main constraints in working with startups overall? Yeah. Well, I think, um, you know, I touched upon this a little bit, but obviously startups are usually, you know, a small team um, and they might not have as much resource as a bigger company, for example. Um, they might be working across sectors. They might not have sector specific knowledge uh, that would enable them to move quickly in fashion, in automotive. You know, I keep bringing up the same ones in food or whatever it is, but uh, that's where um, there is an exchange and a, a, a relationship building between a, a brand or a supplier and the innovator to be able to really exchange on, on what that brand or supplier needs and getting that information uh, across to the startup or the innovator and the, then the innovator being able to deliver back on that. I think that the timelines are often quite different as well. Like uh, it, there are certain processes in place for bigger companies and the startups are ready to move quite quickly. So <clears throat> definitely uh, uh, sometimes two different worlds. And it's actually Michael Olmsted from Plug and Play, who's not here right now, but uh, who once uh, I was at a session with him and he was saying that um, what was it? Long maybes kill startups. You know, they need that fast yes or no. And you have bigger companies that are often in the long maybe phase. So I, I think there's, there's often different sort of clashes of, of culture, uh, but such a richness in being able to work with innovators. You know, they, they, um, it's my favorite part of what I, what I do is working with innovators. I just love it because there's so much um, it makes you open your mind. It makes you think differently. It makes you think about poss possibilities. I find it very optimistic, um, looking to change things. Uh, so uh, I think, you know, it, many companies are quite attracted to working with innovators and joining programs like the, the plug and play verticals in order to bring that spirit, the entrepreneurial spirit within, within their own companies. Um, because it, it, it is able to spark a lot of, a lot of change internally and, and make people move more quickly. Absolutely, I couldn't agree more. I think coming into uh, working at Plug and Play, you can really see working with startups is amazing. Entrepreneurs are always innovative, always willing to try new things. Um, yeah. yeah, I would highly recommend to anyone here if you haven't done so already. Um, Christine, thank you so much for the time. I think that's all we can do for today, but okay. hopefully. We'll have um, other time later on. Thank you. That's great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate Bye -bye. being here. Bye-bye. Thank you. As you now know, Plug and Play is a great resource of information, not only to find the most innovative startups, but also to recognize the upcoming trends in order to collaborate. In the past year, we have decided to unite our efforts to focus on the uh, sustainable textile industry and to compile the data the, that the plug and play ecosystem has collected over the years. We have analyzed over 600 startups that are working in sustainable fashion and extracted information on their location, stage, and the year they were founded. These companies span six different continents and are stage agnostic. Based on their technology, we group these companies into 10 different sectors, sectors, which we will highlight throughout the report. For each sector, we included the founding timeline, location, and financial stage. We call it sustainable fashion, but it truly encompasses the textiles journey, or even the materials journey, which travels from the manufacturers, brands, consumers, and recyclers. There's a potential uh, for a lot more and we could expand the impact categories in the future as well. So we would love to hear your thoughts and feedback. We are excited to announce that this is just the beginning. We truly believe the solutions start with communications to start insights and promote collaboration. Moving forward, we'd like to bring you manufacturers, brands, recyclers, to discuss how we can promote circularity in the space together. Today, we just simply want to share the trends in the space, reduce stigma, and share the most innovative startups in each of these categories from all around the world. Trends really lie in the circular economy of textiles. Last week, a team of researchers from Lund University in Finland published in the environmental research letters that circularity is not always a solution, especially when it comes to greenhouse gas emissions due to transportation and the recycling process uh, involved. 
It was very interesting. It is true that recycling does require higher energy than it's just simply being buried or burned. But I think we should be looking at the larger picture and the progress these technologies could bring. In general, to be more sustainable, we should buy less and wear our clothes longer. This is unfortunately not something large brands can actively do to reduce their impact. So to decrease the textiles waste, we, which was estimated to be around 17 million ton uh, back in 2018 globally, we need to push for its circularity. And this is not going to happen if there's no communication between the players of the textiles journey. This report will guide you through the stages of the textiles journey production, from material production, to consumer use, to disposal, and ideally back into a use phase. It is important to highlight that many of the startups we reviewed do impact more than one of these sectors. So we group them based on where we saw their largest effect. We have the chance to have top, the top 10 startups presenting their technologies and products with us today. After each presentation, a poll will pop up asking if you would like an introduction with a startup. If you want to learn more, we highly encourage you to click yes, as we'll make sure to connect you with the founder afterwards. This regional breakdown shows the global reach of startups working in sustainable fashion. Almost half of the startup in this industry are from Europe, followed, followed closely by North America with many in Asia as well. However, we do see far less in the Southern hemisphere and a growth in Asia. This timeline shows the cumulative amount of startups in each sector found, uh, founded in each sector founded every year since 2010, we found that the most startups are working in, the dig in digitalizations, which includes virtual technologies that provide solutions for inventory waste, including new manufacturing processes, accurate sizing, and digital fashion. This amount is the result of an increased need for transparency and the large number of investments in software companies compared to hardware. Recommerce, the next largest number of startups, is another important sector, which um, startups in with startups in resale and rental. Bio-based, upcycled materials, and sustainable dyes are on the feedstock side of the supply chain and include alternative yarns, fibers, fabrics, leathers, uh, and new dyes technologies. The number of startups in bio-based over the years is very close to the one of transparency, which includes all startups facilitating the textile supply chain and reducing inventory, excess, and waste. Textile Care proposes uh, solutions for the treatment of textiles prior and during its lifespan. And lastly, recycling and textile to textile deal with converting textile into other materials or in true circular economy back to textiles. And we can actually see a little bit of a change in 2000, 2013, which was the year of the Rana Plaza collapse, the garments industry worst accident to date, as you probably know. And another uh, increase a little bit in uh, 2018. And that year we did some research and uh, there was some landmarks in growing consumer awareness about around the ethics of sustainable manufacturing and production in fashion. That year, uh, many uh, major luxury houses also, such as Chanel, Versace, Michael Kors, Burberry, and Gucci, went worth fur free. Uh, and the use of recycling plastic cotton, uh, plastic bottles in fashion products became increasingly common. So let's first look at feedstock. It is estimated that about 63% of all textiles are derived from petrochemicals or releasing a considerable amount of CO2 emissions. So finding new solutions will help decrease carbon emissions overall. We separated feedstock into bio-based materials, upcycled materials, and dyes. We wanted to show you the overall opportunity when it comes to feedstock. So it's, uh, this is all the startups working on raw materials relative to one another. You can see here in bio-based uh, materials, it's synthetic. Synthetic is any startup that can have a variety of bio-based feedstock, but are mainly focusing on the production of these materials in the lab and often try to biomimic nature, such as wool, spider webs, etc. 
you can also see biosynthesis, which is the development of biological processes, um, often with microbes and enzymes. Biosynthesis is actually more than 25% of all bio-based startups and are all very early stage. There are still some limitation when it comes to scalability, but we truly believe that there, is, there will be an increase in the number of startups in that space and also we'll find very interesting technologies and promising ones. On the upcycling side, you can see restoration. Uh, what we mean by that is any dead, dead stock or excess inventory that are being uh, upcycled. The, the textile is not being decomposed. The material is just restored right into a new material product. The majority of startups under industrial waste is rubber uh, from tires. And what you can see here is a large amount of startups are focusing on plastic upcycling which provides a solution for excessive single-use plastic waste. Uh, and most of these startups are found in China and the United States. It is interesting to notice that yes, a recycled plastic is only adding one new life cycle to the material. And uh, we often end up with a similar problem of recyclability at the end. And generally even worse as the mix of fibers is more difficult to recycle than pure plastic. However, the production of recycled PET generates 79% less carbon emissions than its virgin self, which might be an efficient way to reduce your carbon footprint. We also see almost as many startups in the bio-based and upcycling side, which we found uh, quite surprising. We believe that the amount in the upcycling space is going to increase over time as we try to find more solutions for our waste, but also startups today focusing on plant-based materials are often trying to shift to waste feedstock. This is the bio-based material. So if that's any natural or synthetic material made up of a su substance derived from living matter, uh, this includes plant fibers, such so mushrooms, leather, apple leather, lignin, bamboo um, fibers, organic cotton, which is what you just saw on the previous slide. On the first uh, graph, this is the timeline you already saw. We're solely looking at the bio-based material. Uh, we actually see a huge or an increase uh, starting in 2015. As I previously mentioned, there is an increase in awareness and often uh, the first obvious solution to entrepreneurs or for entrepreneurs is bio-based. Also, in December 2015, the European Commission announced in their circular economy package that they were going to support innovation in the bioeconomy. And as you can see, most of the startups are based in Europe, and that is due to the regulations and government grants in the space. The challenge of this space is the properties of the fibers. We obviously want to match the properties of the fibers that are already on the market, such as the strength of nylon or the thermal, thermal insulation provided by cotton, uh, which makes it very challenging. Uh, that is actually reflected in the financial breakdown as well. You see a huge decrease in the startup raising Series A after their seed round, and that's due to scalability and cost. When it comes to series A or even B round, there is often difficulty in the new material space. Founders are asking for investments to reduce costs and scale up, while investors are already expecting low cost manufacturing, the ability to scale up. I do think that there is there, um, if there was not this challenge and maybe misconception of the startup stage and product development, there will be more bio-based materials on the market today. Very exciting startups in the space. Uh, the Cerdo is a Mexican startup who made a lot of noise on social media uh, about a year ago to do their strong cacti material. Today, they are collaborating with H&M and Clay. Kintra Fibers uh, started their collaboration with Pengaya. Um, Kintra was founded in 2019 in New York. Uh, they developed a new synthetic and bio-based polymer to replace nylon and they claim it for it to be softer and stronger than their competitors. And finally, Natural Fiber Welding, NFW, which was founded in 2015 in the US, is a cellulose base uh, from uh, cellulose based materials, usually from hemp, cotton, silk, etc. And recently announced their partnership with All Birds and Ralph Lauren. Akedina, I'll now pass it on to you to introduce another amaz amazing startup in the space. Our first startup presentation of the day is Nusa. Nusa fiber is made from GMO-free corn, 
which makes a natural biodegradable and 100% recyclable product. They help the textile industry reduce waste at the close consumer level, but also during the production process by collecting textiles at their end of life to recycle them back into a 100% virgin fiber. And this can happen endlessly. Please welcome Luna Aslan to the stage as she explains Nusa Fiber further. Hello everyone, my name is Luna Aslan. I'm the co-founder of Nusa, the circular textile fiber. So born from bio-renewable material, Nusa Fiber is 100% recyclable thanks to our patented technology. In other words, we regenerate your old textiles back into a virgin fiber and this endlessly. Nusa was born in 2019 based on the observation of the textile industry that is the second most polluting in the world and with less than one person of textile fiber being reused. So based on that, we aim at revolutionizing the textile industry uh, by fighting pre-consumer waste and post-consumer waste. So how do we do that? We start from a GMO-free corn that is then transformed into lactic acid, something natural that your body produces, and that is today used as a natural food conservator. So from it, we are able to extrude a textile fiber that we then spin into a yarn. And those are two products that we sell directly to brands or to the manufacturer, and that will transform it into an end product. So here I take the example of a garment, but it can also be way more technical as application. Then the customer has the opportunity to just bring it back during the whole life cycle. And as NUSA, we give the guarantee that thanks to our patented new cycle process, it will be recycled back into a virgin quality fiber without being deteriorated to reach circular economy back again. Um, so our technology allows us to separate our fiber from any type of contaminant, whether it is pigments, coatings or other material blends. On top of its bio-based and recycling aspects, our product also shows great intrinsic properties that are particularly relevant for the textile industry, such as increased breathability, low odor retention, um, it is also low flammable, bacteriostatic, hyperallergenic, and stable to UV. So again, based on that, you can think of many different applications. After raising half a million euro in seed round in March 2020, we also won a, an award of another half million euro for the most innovative startup in Belgium. So thanks to that, we were able to really accelerate our development and grow the team. So today we're six and we are based in Brussels, Belgium, where we have uh, uh, our offices and also our chemical lab and textile lab. Um, so today we are accelerating our business and we're doing product development with some of the largest European retailers. So if you're interested to close the loop with NUSA, don't hesitate to contact us, visit our website www.nusafiber.com or connect with me on LinkedIn and I'd be more happy to answer all of your questions. Thank you very much for your attention and see you soon. Thank you, Nusa, for this great presentation. Uh, let's move on to upcycled materials. So that's, again, any raw materials from other markets, upcycling uh, agricultural waste, plastic, tires, etc. The fashion industry is actually one of the first industries to look at other value chains and their challenges when it comes to innovation. The startups have been almost doubling in the past two years, again, often as a result of waste management and the demand of four alternative feedstock in the textile industry. We see a little bit more of a distribution when it comes to region, and that might be due to the importance of the waste problem in all region uh, and the potential to integrate it into fiber. Interestingly here, more startups pass the seed round, and that's due to their properties. Most of them are plastic um, and which already have a great uh, uh, recycling technologies, but also what happens with upcycling um, 
product is that we change the feedstock, but we do not always change the end product. The properties might be um, a little bit lower than the virgin ones, but it still stays the same final product, which help them being able to uh, commercialize faster. Amazing startups in the space. Uh, Thread is one of them. It's actually different from both Thread, uh, which makes the mushroom leather. Thread has two sides of their business. Uh, the plastic pickup under First Mile and their fabric brand under Thread. They've already collab collaborated with Puma, Ralph Lauren, Irie, and many others. Zola, founded, um, which was founded last year in Oakland, is tackling a challenging waste source, which is carbon dioxide from greenhouse gases. Their proposition would therefore enable for the production of a sustainable fibers, uh, of sustainable fibers while reducing the carbon footprint. They were part of our last uh, new materials program. And Perpetual is uh, a little bit of an older company which was uh, founded in the US in 2008. And they depolymerize plastic PT bottle to turn them into different products, including textile fibers. They have partnered with Adidas, Decathlon, and manufacturers such as Polygenta. So I'll pass it down to you, Akedina, to present another great startup. Our next startup here is Fortify. Fortify is a fabric and garment technology company that helps clothing brands design new sustainable fabrics and garments for their production lines. Fortify can do things as simple as making fabrics that are easier to clean, super stretch, and as complex as making fabrics that are efficient to produce. I'll let Stan and Laura take it away from here. Hi, good day everyone. My name is Stan, founder of Fortify. Fortify is a B2B sustainable fabric and garment technology company providing recycled and biodegradable fabrics for apparel and clothing brands. Hi, my name is Laura. I work on the sales and development side of Fortify. Fortify was launched in quarter four of 2018 after graduating from Y Combinator Startup School. Fortify became a Blue Science System partner in 2019 and was named Global Top 5 Plant-Based Textile Startup in 2020 by Stardust Austria. The Fortify team of 11 people is comprised of engineers, technologists, uh, fashion development professionals with multiple competencies working on sustainable fashion. Fortify has been bootstrapping since it launched and managed to secure some angel funding and grants totaling $60,000. Fortify work on sustainable fashion solution of closed loop fashion. Garment at the end of its life cycle can be recycled and spun back into new fabric or garment using organic solutions. The dissolving and creation can be done in micro factory operation. For natural fibers, our biohacking approach utilizes organic waste to reproduce biopolymers that can be spun into biodegradable and recyclable fabric. Fortify also working with technology partners like VDT, universities, and sustainable textile mills to provide sustainable garment as well as post garment upcycling for added value finishing. We work with swimwear brands such as Now Then on closed loop synthetic fiber swimwear in which the garment can be spun out after being discarded and dissolved with organic solvent. Other brands like Supertex work with Fortify to develop recycled organza fabrics for their evening wear collections. On using our biodegradable fabrics, brands like Target and Canada We both adopted the PLA PHBV fabrics in their production of casual knitwear shirts. Besides working with our customers to provide biodegradable and recycled fabrics, Fortify also partners with brands like Paul Frank and HLA in organic finishing and upcycling for garments to add value and functionality to their fashion collections. Fortify also works with designer brands like Telfar and fashion startups like Iconic to provide made-to-order production with sustainable practice. We currently seek seed funding to further scale our business and capacities. We are also looking for a partnership with clothing brands and fashion brands to adopt our technology and our offerings. 
We also welcome any kind of sustainable supply chain partnership with our fashion ecosystem. Thank you very much and please contact us if you would like to know more about us and how we can work with you all for a better sustainable fashion. Thank you. Thank you, Fortify, for sharing these amazing solutions. I would now like to bring sustainable dyes to your attention. Some evidence shows that textile dyeing dates back as early as the New Stone Age. Um, so this is not new. Dyes were originally derived from sources found in nature, such as vegetable, plants, trees, uh, and insects. Innovation in this space is very important, as these predominantly focus on minimizing the amount of water and chemical use uh, while processing. Startups are working on water pollution and usage. On average, alternative dyes are said to use 90% less water and chemical compared to traditional dyeing. The World Bank has identified 72 toxic chemicals that end up in waterways from textile dyeing. There are many startups in the space, uh, but we do see a lot of collaboration with the ones that exist. There is less of a push from consumer customers in this sector, uh, either from the lack of awareness or solutions or the difficulty of the challenge, uh, which is reflected in the number of startups. Dyes impact recycling, so finding circular solutions in the space will solve a lot of other challenges. Most of them are based in Europe for a similar reason to the bio-based startups, probably because of government grants. Uh, when we look at a uh, financial breakdown, in general, if there is a certainty that the product is scalable and less toxic to the manufacturers and environment, collaboration will happen. We don't see uh, that much interest yet when it comes to the VC side, uh, but I would highly encourage you to take a closer look. So I hope this quick overview helped. Three amazing startups again. Uh, Spin Dye, which was founded in 2015, is a water-free dyeing technology and featured in um, the sustainable collection by H&M. One of the oldest companies in the space, Daiku, which was founded in 2008 in the Netherlands, um, and their technology is now used by brands such as Nike, Adidas, Peak Performance, and more. Colorifix uh, was founded in the UK in 2016, and they're using a synthetic biology to produce, deposit, and fix dyes, avoiding harmful chemicals while reducing water, energy, and waste. Um, and they actually have just raised $9 million from, from investors, including H&M, Sagana, and Cambridge Enterprises. Thank you for listening so far. And before, before we move on to the second part of the value chain, focusing on the life of the textile, uh, I will pass it on to Akadina again to welcome the next very exciting company. Thank you. Synovance is the final startup in our feedstock section of today's event. Um, and so before we move on, I wanted to ask a quick poll question that'll pop up on your screen in just a second. Um, as a brand, do you currently source any alternative raw materials for your textile production? Just take a few seconds, respond to that. Um, and then we'll jump right in to the Sinovance presentation. Sinovance is a biotech company that uses microorganisms to produce natural dyes for textiles from sustainable biomass waste. Their innovative bio-based solutions are sustainable, do not pollute the environment, and will divert hundreds of tons of waste from landfills. Let's hear more from the Sinovance team. Bioproduction is a way to manufacture industrial ingredients that's much more eco-friendly than existing processes. At Sinovance, we can make it happen with a highly experienced team bound by a shared desire to make a sustainable impact. I am Brian. I'm an American. 
I have a PhD in genetics and 20 years experience in synthetic biology, as well as six years industrial research experience scaling up R&D projects. Hello, I'm Effie. I'm from Greece. I have a PhD in biochemistry and over 15 years of experience doing research in molecular biology. I also hold a master's from ATC Business School. My name is Olivier. I'm French. I've got 20 years of experience in finance and CFO positions, as well as as an independent consultant. After decades of research studying genetic regulation, we have uncovered how factors such as genome folding influence gene expression. We are applying our findings to rapidly and cost-effectively design and engineer robust microorganisms that are optimized for industrial bioproduction. We have already produced a proprietary DNA assembly and cloning kit that is more efficient than the current market leader many times over. Currently, strain development is the biggest bottleneck in bioproduction. It is costly and time-consuming. Synavance Technologies accelerates strain development, producing strains in less than one-third of the time and at a tenth of the cost with just one or two people. Our first target is textile industry, the second most chemically intensive industry in the world, responsible for a whopping 20% of the world's freshwater pollution. Using our disruptive synthetic genomic technologies, Synovans can produce eco-friendly textile dyes made from biomass waste. Because we produce the same molecule as the synthetic dye, our dyes can be used by manufacturers without any change in the performance or the production process. Our prototypes are already attracting the attention of major brands and manufacturers. Beyond dyes, Synovance Technologies has the potential to impact several different markets, from chemical products to food and aromas to pharmaceuticals, therapeutics, and cosmetics. A large range of applications need to be replaced using sustainable bioproduction. At Synovance, our work has just begun. Thank you so much, Cinevance, for your video presentation. My name is Alexandra Pine, and I'm a Ventures Analyst at Plug and Play, working in new materials and packaging and sustainability. I'll be presenting the next two segments of the value chain, starting with the consumer-facing side. This sector focuses on technologies and trends that are relevant to the use phase of textiles, which has become increasingly important as consumer demands for sustainability and transparency increase. A McKinsey survey from 2020 showed that 67% of surveyed consumers consider the use of sustainable materials to be an important purchasing factor. The topics that we cover in this section serve as an important opportunity for brands to meet their consumer demands. The first topic we'll look at is textile care, which really focuses on preventing byproducts such as microplastics and harmful chemicals from entering and persisting in our water systems. Even if the raw materials used to create the textiles are completely safe for the environment, the product's sustainability diminishes if large amounts of chemicals and toxins are used in the manufacturing process. We split this topic into functional technologies and laundry solutions. Laundry Solutions encompasses about 22% of this category. This includes technologies to reduce and eliminate microplastics during the washing process by decreasing how often clothing needs to be washed or using new methods for filtering and capturing. The other 78% of this category consists of technologies for functionalization. This includes green chemicals and finishes to make the textiles anti-odor, antimicrobial, water, and stain repellent. Many of the startups we see in this space, especially in the finishing and coating sector, were founded before 2010, but have taken a long time to grow, which is why we see a lot at the seed stage, where they then combine with the newer consumer trends, such as laundry solutions. Most of these startups are based in developed countries where there's a push from the consumer for environmentally friendly practices. 
One interesting startup that we would like to highlight is Beyond Surface Technologies, which was founded in 2008. So they've had some time to grow and have had very interesting collaborations with Patagonia, Adidas, PVH, Gap, Levi's, and many others. Our next startup is revolutionizing laundry detergent, Kind Laundry. Kind Laundry is a purpose-driven company whose mission is to eliminate plastic laundry jugs and packaging, polluting our landfills and oceans while providing people with a more eco-friendly laundry cleaning solution. Please welcome Kind Laundry to tell us more. Hey everyone, we're Kind Laundry. I'm very excited today to introduce to you a more sustainable and healthier way to do your laundry. To begin, I would like to share a shocking fact with you. Did you know we dump the equivalent of one garbage truck load of plastic into the ocean every single minute? Less than 10% of the plastic that we throw away are actually recycled. And by 2025, we're going to have more plastic in the ocean than fish. This is a global catastrophe that we just can't ignore. At Kind Laundry, our mission is to turn the tide on single-use laundry detergent plastic jugs and provide an alternative solution in a laundry detergent category that has never seen advancement in almost a century. Kind Laundry is a laundry detergent that is in a sheet format. Similar to how you would use a dryer sheet, simply toss the detergent sheet into your washing machine and you're all set. Our packaging is completely zero waste. We don't test on animals. It is fully biodegradable, safe for those with sensitive skin. Our sheets are fully pre-cut and pre-measured and, it's, and it still contains the same strong cleaning power as conventional laundry detergent. The current global laundry detergent market is estimated to be $80 billion. By 2027, it is expected to grow to over $100 billion. Everyone in this world does laundry, but there are only a handful of brands that dominate this category which means there's a tremendous potential in the market to reach consumers that are looking for an alternative, especially an alternative that is truly sustainable. Now, how does Kind Laundry compare to conventional detergent? So as we've mentioned, our packaging is fully, about, fully recyclable, so there's no single-use plastic. We only have five simple plant-derived ingredients versus 25 plus toxic chemicals that latches onto your fabric and makes contact with your skin all day long. It is pre-measured, pre-cut, which means there are no messy measuring cups. It is lightweight and easy to travel with versus, well, you can't really travel with a heavy detergent bottle. Small and compact, which means it's easier to handle and also it takes up less space in your laundry room. Since our launch eight months ago, we've been featured in a number of publications. The most notable one for us is the award from Better Homes and Gardens magazine for the best eco-friendly laundry detergent out of the 200 products that they tested, and many of which are owned by big giant CPG companies. We're Bernard and Angie, co-founders of Kind Laundry. We're very passionate about sustainability. We love animals and we eat a plant-based diet. Kind Laundry is our way to provide an alternative to those that are on a sustainability journey, much like ourselves. We're currently looking to work with clothing brands that have a sustainability mission behind it. Even though clothing and laundry goes hand in hand, we rarely see partnerships done which can help cross promote through our audiences. We're also looking to work with lifestyle brands that consumer may not necessarily always associate laundry detergent with, such as travel, outdoors, and sports. For example, we just launched our travel pack detergent sheets, which can make cleaning your clothes much easier on the go. Last but not least, we're continuously working with our chemists to innovate our formulation to ensure we're always staying ahead and provide a product that is truly unique to the laundry detergent category. Thank you very much for listening to this presentation and we look forward to any questions.
Thank you, Kind Laundry, for your presentation about your company. Next, we will move on to the digitalization component of the value chain. As you can see by the high number of startups in this space, digitalization is a topic that has been gaining a lot of traction as people are looking for new paths towards sustainability. It includes virtual technologies that provide solutions for inventory waste, including new manufacturing processes, accurate sizing, and digital fashion. Although fast fashion has become a buzzword for apparel makers, most consumers are simply looking to replace an item that they already own. This is especially true in intimates and basics, but also for higher fashion and athletic products, where the majority of shopping is repeat purchases. Brands work hard to create new and different collections, but this often results in excess inventory. Repeat buying habits can serve as an opportunity for retailers to reduce their waste through design and prototyping. Sizing encompasses 57% of this category and includes methods to find the perfect fitting clothes, such as apps and AR for measurements, 3D imaging, and customization. These features help to decrease return rates, therefore decreasing the emissions and energy costs associated with transportation. 36% of these startups have developed technologies for manufacturing, including rapid and efficient prototyping and production of clothing. The prototyping and modeling softwares advertise digital products which are created on demand after they are sold, eliminating the need for samples and reducing overstock. The remaining 7% of digitalization is the newer trend of digital fashion. This takes the digital representation of garments one step further by never actually producing the physical products and only selling a virtual version. With the new generation and the importance of online presence, the digital market is growing fast. One survey of 2000 women in the UK found that on average, respondents wore an item seven times. Other researchers have found that some women wear an item just once because they don't want to repeat an outfit in a photo posted on social media. It is important to note that digital fashion is a great path towards sustainability. Creating outfits that are not physically existent would obviously decrease an enormous amount of waste, carbon footprint, and water pollution. The growth of the trend can be seen through brands like H&M, who recently released their billion dollar collection, which consists entirely of virtual clothing. The Fabricant is one example of a digital fashion house. They started in the Netherlands and have partnered with the Buffalo London, DressX, Adidas, Under Armour, and more. You don't have to shop less when you shop digital fashion. Meet DressX, the first multi-brand retailer of digital fashion clothing. Shop for digital fashion clothes from top designer brands and 3D designers. Please meet Daria and Natalia as they tell us more about how it works. Hi, my name is Daria and I'm the founder of DressX. Hi, I'm Natalia, DressX founder. We're here to present you the company and our view on the future of fashion that in our case is digital, accessible and non-polluting. So basically in the past 11 months uh, when the company exists and when we started it, uh, since we started it, we managed to make everyone believe that not all of the clothes should exist in their physical versions and they can only exist in digital. What we mean by that, that some of the clothes can only be bought on the photography and on the videos because because so many of us, especially Gen Zs and Millennials, are present on social media and different digital platforms. So what we are doing at DressX is building your digital wardrobe that will be accessible for every customer in the world. So our team consists of two founders whom you see here. Our tech team is based in Ukraine and is led by our CTO, uh, who built a number of successful projects in the past. And uh, one of our core team members is the head of product of DressX, and she was the director of Snap Ukraine. We raised to date around three million dollars, and we have a lot of great investors and advisors who help us to build the product. So the way it works right now at DressX.com is that every customer can submit their image while choosing the digital look they want to wear on this particular image and then receive it back where they're wearing digital look that they purchased. And this content is ready to be published on their social media and across various digital platforms. And just in a couple of weeks from now, 
we are launching our first dress sex app where some of our looks will be ava available as AR looks and uh, will be available to dress in real time and to elevate your social media even beyond. So, and here we want to present a couple of the case studies of how we work with corporations and the brands. So, Natalia, please, stage is yours. Thank you. I'll start with our very first uh, digitized collection that was a LVMH prize recognized brand Pascal. You can see to the left there is a lady wearing the real dress and to the right our client uh, who purchased this uh, dress and this image for $60 instead of paying $800 for the physical one. And the next uh, case uh, is about a uh, revolutionary project because with Buffalo London, for the first time, the brand of uh, physical clothes and shoes uh, created this collection as a revenue stream, not as a marketing tool for them. So it was revolutionary and it was sold out. With Lunia, we created another marketing project for their launch of like printed collection and more than 50 influencers were dressed up in our digital fashion robe. With the Gary James McQueen, who is a nephew of Alexander McQueen, we stepped into gaming world because uh, for the first time, a uh, digital fashion collection that was available for photo dressing at DressX was also inside the gaming engine, inside the fashion show that we created together. Uh, in the uh, next project with um, Australian Fashion Week, we uh, dressed up more than 500 people in five days and it was absolute heat and the most popular digital fashion outfit so far. So what we uh, do for the brands, we tend to be this go-to destination for everything digital and everything wearable across different uh, platforms. Uh, we have the influencer marketing campaign optimization. We have the API available for digital dressing and AR implementation in the future. Um, and we are very welcome to start uh, working with more designers and brands. Thank you, DressX, for that great presentation. The next category is transparency, which involves software-based startups that focus on various solutions throughout the supply chain. The Bureau of Labor Statistics reports that between 1990 and 2012, the U.S. textile and garment industry lost more than three quarters of the sector's labor force, while apparel and textile jobs nearly doubled globally. This data can be explained by the textile industry's pivot to fast fashion and cheaper production. Transparency is key to ensure an ethical supply chain and working conditions. More and more businesses are trying to keep their sourcing and production local to reduce any unnecessary costs and pollution. Overall, this sector focuses on startups increasing the traceability of materials and products, as well as those promoting sustainable sourcing and social impact. Compared to some of the hardware sectors, we see more investment in this space due to the faster scalability of these software companies. This can be seen by the slightly higher percentage of startups going past the Series A round. It also demonstrates the need and demand for more transparency. These demands for increased transparency and upcycling of materials can be met using technologies such as RFID and QR codes that enable the traceability and tracking of a garment. Garments are often made of different materials, which is not always coherent to their tags. Incorporating traceability of the individual fibers will also enable more efficient recycling. On the supply chain side, change will be difficult until there's a real understanding of the complete impact of textiles. Initial solutions include platforms that promote suppliers with environmentally friendly practices and increase visibility throughout the supply chain. These solutions enable us to understand the limitations of the industry and serve as an opportunity for innovation. One exciting startup in this space is Advanced eTextiles, which develops RFID threads for traceability and has had several partnerships since it was founded in 2006, including one with Microsoft. Our next startup here today is the Material Exchange. The Material Exchange provides fashion apparel and footwear brands a centralized B2B platform to work more efficiently with manufacturers and material suppliers. 
It plays a key role in assisting brands and suppliers in the digitalization of material data needed to source and create products. Darren, please take it away. And I'm CEO of Material Exchange. We're building the world's biggest marketplace for sourcing materials for the footwear and apparel industries. We were established in 2018. Our mission has always been to digitize relationships between big brands and material suppliers. And when I say material suppliers, I mean materials like leather, knit, woven, anything that will be required to produce a product. We are a team of 70 people. I come from within the fashion industry and fashion tech, and we have over 350 suppliers that we work with from all over the world. We represent about 40,000 different materials across 11 countries, and we've closed two investment rounds, totaling 6 million in investment. The problem that we're solving is to really clean up the world of sourcing. So brands obviously source materials. There is a lot of wastage that occurs, whether that be wastage in material consumption, uh, use of physical samples when choosing materials for building products, slow production times, and the huge amount of travel that brands need to uh, engage in order to meet with their suppliers. Our goal is to digitize the entire process to avoid this wastage. We are creating the world's leading marketplace, which connects suppliers with buyers across the globe and makes it more efficient for them to work together. It reduces costs and it's more transparent. Our product has two sides. The first is the buy side. This is where buyers can search for materials. We also have a smart search where they can build searches based on material type. So for example, if you're only interested in leather, you can build a search that will keep on growing and adding new materials and new suppliers over time. We really accelerate the research process of finding materials and also we provide a lot of information around sustainability. The suppliers have a single platform where to digitize their data and showcase their materials. They also have the ability to sell those materials across the globe and build their own unique story. We have credibility with our data. It's backed by the GS1, which is the Global Standards Group. We also have a very robust messaging system that connects the communication between all parties. We are backed by some of the largest organizations in the world and work with some of the biggest footwear and uh, apparel brands. We also have some of the leading suppliers in the world. We are pushing heavily towards sustainability. We want to show buyers of materials, which materials are more sustainable, which ones have um, water saving, which ones are more ethical, which ones have um, better impact for the environment. And we're developing our own badge system. There are over 500 sustainable initiatives and we want to make it clearer for those who want to source more sustainable materials. We have an interesting case study through a partner of ours, which is called Kingpins, which is the biggest denim show in the world. They've used our platform to connect 50 of the biggest denim suppliers in the world with over 2000 denim buyers. And we have now millions in transactions going through the system. This has been really successful. Their show actually couldn't take place because of COVID. And now they've moved to using our platform to being a 24 seven sourcing platform. We now work very closely with Kingpins and will continue to grow our relationship. One of the reasons I was super excited to be here, it gives us an opportunity to potentially meet more brand customers internationally and also suppliers. We're looking for industry thought leaders that can help us push our sustainable goals through. And ultimately we are moving to our series A in September of this year. So we'll be looking to close a new investment round. I really appreciate your time and thank you very much. My name is Darren Glenister, CEO of Material Exchange, and thank you again. Thank you, Material Exchange, for the presentation on your marketplace. Next, we will look at packaging trends specific to the retail and e-commerce industries. The physical design and makeup of packaging can be advanced by changing the shape using less materials 
and altering the components and materials used during production. 43% of these companies are developing different materials such as bio-based and alternative feedstocks, whereas 17% are changing the design through the use of technologies like additives. The other 40% involve startups working on the shipping side of things, including reverse logistics companies that offer brands a system to implement reusable and returnable packaging. These entrepreneurs have the ability to build their own value chain from scratch and choose their end market. They often promote their green features as a competitive advantage and target a higher capital market. This is a popular sector that is also influenced by the consumer's demand for sustainability. Restrictions on in-person activities due to COVID-19 have led to increased online traffic for e-commerce sites, thus providing an easier path for D2C brands to reach clients and consumer platforms to promote those brands. This comes with an increased need for sustainable yet reliable packaging. Similar to the feedstock sector where we saw the use of alternative materials, a lot of these startups are based in Europe due to the availability and incentive of government grants. Not many pass the Series A raise because it becomes difficult to maintain the properties and costs that are competitive with those currently on the market while also keeping it scalable. Two startups that we want to highlight are TIPA, which produces eco-friendly polybags and has worked with brands such as La Strange London, Kangaya, and Stella McCartney. The second one we wanna highlight is Traceless, which was a newer startup creating a novel packaging material from agricultural waste. They were part of our last new materials and packaging batch, as well as the most recent cohort with Fashion for Good. Before we get into the next presentation, we have another quick poll for you. As a consumer, have you purchased any clothing claiming to be made using more sustainable practices? Feel free to take a second, answer that. Awesome, thank you. Um, and moving right along, we have Pakurang next. Um, Pakurang is a supplier of innovative reusable packaging and transport ecosystems. They help reduce the environmental impact of transport by replacing single-use packaging with more financially and environmentally sustainable solutions. Their packaging is made from recycled bottles and designed to last 50 plus trips. Let's hear more. Hello, my name is Alvin Lear. I'm one of the two co-founders of Packerang, a government-backed Norwegian startup uh, within reusable packaging. We um, are quite a, a we're a growing team, and we're also part of a, a government-owned, uh, partly owned uh, incubator. Actually, um, this is our internal team currently, and we're growing quite fast with 14 country representatives in 12 different markets. We started our product and, um, and uh, market research in 2019, but we formally launched in 2020 early on. Uh, since then, we received uh, some government grants, over 50,000 of those, um, and uh, as mentioned, got into the incubator uh, Schiller Innovation and started developing our mobile app, Consumer Facing. Uh, in 2021, we focused more on the return system. We raised $400,000 uh, in our seed rounds and uh, integrated with 53 major uh, couriers, including DHL, FedEx, um, DPD, Royal Mail, and a lot of uh, others uh, of them as well. We're currently covering 95 to 98%, roughly, uh, of uh, several countries, including the UK, Germany, Netherlands, uh, and also Scandinavia. Um, so we have uh, pilots starting in uh, the at the end of this year and also early next year. Uh, also through Austrian Post, um, with whom we won a um, official um, government um, um, tender, actually, uh, and that happened a few weeks ago. So quite excited to uh, to launch in Austria as well uh, in collaboration with them. Um, concept wise, um, it's quite simple. A retailer um, basically ships in a pack bag, and um, these mailer bags that are, are quite flexible. I'll get back to that. Basically, a uh, consumer um, asks for that in the checkout, receives it in the mail rather than a, a traditional parcel uh, box, and uh, Packer takes care of the rest with collection, uh, checking, and cleaning through our partners. Um, user journey-wise, it's like I said, you uh, you choose it in the checkout, 
um, and with our, our uh, user-friendly app, um, basically you uh, utilize the NFC uh, chip that's uh, an RFID that's in the box uh, or in the uh, basically inside the bag rather. And uh, that gives a QR code that's integrated directly with the courier and that's it. And then you receive incentives as well for having done so. Um, E-commerce wise um, is probably the most obvious use case, um, which I've mentioned. B2B, however, also has internal flow, which is very interesting. Um, basically, any company that shifts uh, goods from one store to another, or one warehouse to another, um, quite an in interesting scenario there with uh, you know huge cost savings uh, long term and also uh, better protection of uh, the goods. Benefits are basically broken into financial and environmental. Financial way, uh, financially, it's um, many, many different ways to to uh, to look at it. Uh, every way, every way you look at it, you see savings. Actually, um, better protection, better flexibility, um, increased customer loyalty, of course, uh, is an added bonus as well. Environmentally, um, we have some really good numbers that we could uh, dive into um, in a more thorough uh, presentation. Pilot customers, um, we're looking for um, customers to join our pilots, both for um, B2C and B2B. And um, also um, any brands that move uh, goods internally, um, keeping bags in the loop, for example, have quite a few use cases of that. Return partners also, we look for uh, companies interested in becoming a return points. So that's a paid service. And also green logistics companies um, and couriers that can uh, facilitate um, uh, the return of our bags. Leaving you with uh, this quote by Keith Wheat from uh, Unilever. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Packering, for sharing your presentation. We often have to go back to the beginning of the supply chain to find technologies that prevent waste. But in this section, we will look at the end of the value chain to highlight some alternatives to landfilling, either through re-commerce or recycling. Re-commerce includes platforms and marketplaces that increase the lifespan of garments by encouraging buying secondhand or borrowing. Our analysis of the startups in this space showed that about 40% are working in rental, whereas about 60% are in resale. It's estimated that UK consumers own $42 billion worth of unused clothing that is just sitting in their closets. Resale is a solution that has existed for a long time through thrift shops, but has recently moved online in a more targeted way, where sites are more inviting and glamorous to the consumer. The secondhand market is set to reach $64 billion in the next five years. It's a hot market where we tend to see the highest valuations. One notable company is ThreadUp, which went public earlier this year. There has also been an increased interest in rental subscriptions. Until recently, Renting Clothes has targeted a certain market that is looking for more luxurious items, but now it has expanded to a much larger audience. Its limitations lie in the price per month for e these items, as well as cleaning certifications due to COVID. Clothing rental market has a compound annual growth rate of 11% from 2019 to 2023. We expect high growth and investment in this space, which can already be seen by companies such as Rent the Runway. We see an overall steady increase in both of these sectors with most of the companies based in Europe and North America where the market is found to be more preferable. There are also a few companies that have created their own rental, resale, and take back programs as seen by Timberland, Patagonia, and Urban Outfitters through its partnership with Newly. Our next startup today is Fabricade. Fabricade developed a social model to collect, sort, and redistribute clothes to disadvantaged communities at micro prices. Their goal is to deliver good quality clothing into the hands of people who need them while reducing fabric waste. Let's hear more from Fabricade. Hi, my name is Zulia Halwani and I'm the co-founder of Fabricade. Wait, how about we make this a bit more interesting? 
much better. Welcome to Fabric Aid's headquarters. Fabric Aid is a social enterprise that's tackling a global challenge, and we are present in Lebanon, Jordan, and in the UAE. According to the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, half a trillion dollars in value are lost on a yearly basis due to the underutilization of clothing or the lack of recycling. Also, 77 million people in the Arab world cannot afford to buy first hand clothing. Fabric Aid was able to create an infrastructure for an ethical and sustainable solution for this problem. Let's show you how we do it. It all starts with our clothing collection bins. We have more than 150 clothing collection bins all over the country and increasing their number every single day. These bins collect more than 5 to 10 tons of clothing on a monthly basis. In addition to international shipments and international partnerships. Our team pass by and collect the clothes from the bins on a daily basis. Here they are. Welcome to the Fabric Aid Sorting Facility. Our team receives the clothes and they sort them into different categories. 78% of the clothes are sent to Souq Lekhlanj, 6% are sent to Second Base where it is more hipster and vintage, and then 16% of the clothes cannot be resold or reused. These clothes are sent to our newest concept tree plate where they are upcycled internally. The rest of the clothes are sent to our stores Souq Lekhlanj. Welcome to one of our five Souq Lekhlanj stores. These stores have distributed over a quarter of a million pieces to 50,000 beneficiaries all over the country. The items here are sold at the prices of 30 cents to a maximum of $2, providing people in vulnerable communities with a dignified shopping experience. All of the items that could not be sold in Souq Lekhlanj because they're too vintagey, too hipster, too out there, are sold here in our vintage boutique second day. Our first boutique was destroyed by the Beirut explosion, but only a few months after, we were able to reopen here in the heart of Beirut, Mono. Since we are a social enterprise, all of the sales made by Second Base go back to support the model of Souq Lekhlanj. Now let's get back to that cost. As we expand across the region, we realize that creating a circular textile model cannot be done alone. We are looking to collaborate with organizations that would like to provide vulnerable communities with access to affordable clothing and to reduce fabric waste. The best partnerships happen with open discussions, and we would like to have that discussion with you. So we'll see you soon. Thank you, Fabricade, for that great presentation on secondhand. It is estimated that $193 million worth of clothing go to a landfill each year. Many of these items will be made from synthetic fibers, meaning that they can take anywhere between 20 and 200 years to decompose. Textile recycling includes solutions such as mechanical, chemical, and biological recycling that transform clothing into something other than the textile fibers that they came from. In Europe, approximately 15% of consumer used clothing is recycled, whereas more than 75% of pre used clothing is recycled by the manufacturers. This information is typically shared in a very pessimistic way, but is actually better than other industries such as plastics. If 75% of pre used garments are being recycled, then this proves that the difficulty has more to do with collection than it does with material properties. It is partially up to the brands to work with the consumers and ensure that their products are being recaptured and recycled. All of that being said, there's still a lot of potential for growth and opportunity to innovate in this space. What makes the recycling of these materials difficult is the mixing of different fibers or even proving that it is 100% purely one material. This explains the low number of startups in this sector. But we are seeing an increase in these technologies, especially when it comes to bypassing the separation of fibers and turning to microwave solutions or biological recycling. Biological recycling 
is the use of enzymes or microbes for the complete and controlled biodegradation of a material. Many of the startups in this space are using biological recycling since they are able to target multiple materials and can skip the sorting and separation process. In general, this is a growing market, not only in fashion, but also for the plastic industry. We're starting to see more and more startups working on these solutions, but the technology is still relatively early. One company, Carbios, is a great example of enzymatic recycling, and they have collaborated with some key players in the retail and plastic industries. Meet Blocktex. Blocktex is a clean technology company that recovers polyester and cellulose from textiles and clothing. Blocktex is positioned at the end of the value chain, where raw materials and end of use solutions have the highest environmental impact and revenue potential. Let's learn how they do it. Hello everyone. Thanks for taking the time to learn about Blocktex and our textile recovery technology. My name is Graham Ross and I'm one of the co-founders of Blocktex. Blocktex is just over three years old and our mission is to divert textiles and clothing away from landfill and produce virgin quality recycled materials for reuse. We have a global patent pending for our separation of fiber technology, which focuses on polyester and cotton blended fabrics. We've been operating a pilot facility for 18 months where we've completed paid trials with major brands, commercial textile suppliers like laundries and hotels, and work with many other companies across the textile spectrum. Blocktex recently closed a Series A funding round of $6 million to build and commission a world first commercial scale resource recovery facility. This facility will be fully operational by Q1 2022 with a stage one capacity of 3,800 tonnes per annum. The company was formed by myself and my business partner, Adrian Jones. Adrian and I have extensive backgrounds in the fashion and textile industry. Adrian brings more than 30 years experience running large fashion retail businesses and my experiences in developing sustainable textiles. The executive team includes chemical and mechanical engineers. Blocktex is positioned at the end of the value chain where raw materials and end of use solutions have the highest environmental impact and revenue potential. The problem of textile waste is not new, and it is not, but it is significant. Globally, commercial scale solutions for blended textiles are nascent. To date, developing the necessary technology and capital investment has held back these future businesses. Government policy, consumer demand, and the opportunity of a strong business model through supply and demand customers is now unlocking these solutions. In Australia, where Blocktex is based, there's approximately 1 million tonnes of clothing sent to landfill or overseas each year. Globally, thanks to fast fashion and the more than 100 billion garments produced, the estimated global textile waste volumes will hit 140 million tonnes by 2030. So there's an abundance of supply, but there's also an abundance of product demand. The market demand for recycled polyester is growing year on year, and this is currently being serviced by recy recycled bottles. Our patent pending separation of fiber technology chemically separates polyester and cotton fabrics back into their raw materials. The soft process effectively unlocks the cotton from the polyester, retaining both materials for reuse. This closed loop system delivers resource recovery rates of 95% and produces zero waste. From the soft process, Blocktex manufactures two high value recycled materials, RPET pellets and cellulose powder. Blocktex has a strong environmental impact. We've aligned our business strategies to the UN's Sustainable Development Goals. Importantly, the environmental impact of the soft process is significant. For every one kilogram of textiles processed, we offset 30 kilograms of CO2 emissions. Blocktex is the only chemical separation company in the Southern Hemisphere. We've developed a highly profitable business model with strategic partners in Australia to ensure st stability and growth. We're different to our competitors because our recovered products can be used in many industries, not just the fashion industry. This strategy creates a wide sales funnel and flexibility in targeting markets while scaling the business. Blocktex aims to have two facilities operating in Australia by 2024. These facilities are scalable and modular and Blocktex plans to license a turnkey solution as we scale globally. As our commercial scale facility comes online early 2022, we're looking for demand customers for our RPET and cellulose, we're also interested in talking with potential partners and investors to accelerate our global expansion. Thank you.
Thank you, Blocktex, for your amazing presentation. Textile to textile recycling is a very exciting trend as it provides true circularity in the market space. We separated this from the overall recycling of textiles to take a closer look at companies working to convert this waste back into its original monomers. Of the 15% of used clothing that is recycled, only 1% is recycled back into new clothing. Many startups working in the recycling industry aim to create a circular economy as they grow larger. Companies at all stages are beginning to realize the need for this and the collaboration that it will entail within the textile industry. As I mentioned earlier, a lot of the excess materials from the manufacturing process, such as unused inventory and scraps, can be recycled into new feedstocks to reduce the demand for virgin materials. A lot of this manufacturing takes place in Asia, which is why we see a larger presence there, where recycling is done closer to production and the source of waste. While this is a relatively new technology, there's a lot of promise in this space as it is a key component of achieving full circularity in the fashion industry. The difficulty remains in the mixing of different fibers and dyes within a garment. At Plug and Play, we are keeping a close eye on new startups in this space as we believe that those who succeed in taking cost and scalability into account will have a high chance to provide changes in the industry. In general, hardware takes more time to develop, which also explains why so many brands are working with only a few of the more famous startups, including Purify Global and Infinite Fiber, which collaborate with MS, Walmart, and Nike and H&M, PVH, and Patagonia, respectively. And before we move into our final presentation, let's have one last poll. Should be popping up now. Which part of the supply chain do you want to learn more about? Um, take a second and think about that while we move on. Um, feel free to check as many boxes. I think that's um, available. And last but not least, we have Refibered. Refibered develops an AI and robotics-based textile recycling system that sorts and recycles unsorted, discarded textiles into new. Refibered Thread has a large range of applications in the textile industry, from industrial knitting to hand embroidery. Let's hear more from Sarika. Hi, everyone. My name is Sarika Bajaj, and I'm the CEO and co-founder of Refibered. So Refibert has developed a textile recycling system that uses AI and robotics to autonomously sort and recycle discarded clothing into new 100% recycled thread. We'll get into the specifics on how exactly we make that happen, but first a little bit about the company. So Refibert was founded a little over a year ago in May 2020 through Carnegie Mellon's Venture Bridge Accelerator program. This program gave us the 25K in initial funding to help fund our research, and that allowed us to create an MVP of our spectroscopy-based sorting process and become patent pending on our chemical recycling process, both of which we'll explain really soon. Also in the last year, we were actually awarded the South by Southwest 2021 Best Bootstrap Company Award, and we were also a social and culture top five finalist. More recently, we actually completed our pre-seed round of funding of $500,000 with our lead investor of Better Ventures. And we've also recently received a $50,000 NSF grant to help continue fund our work. So what exactly is Refibird's approach to textile recycling? I'm sure everyone here understands that textile waste is a huge problem. 93 million tons of textile waste are generated each year, but less than 1% is recycled. Now, this is a big problem, especially coming from post-consumer waste, the clothes that consumers throw away. These are all fabrics that have so many mixed blends that will have layers of different materials. Like imagine a coat that might have three different layers of completely different materials. And we can never ever recycle something efficiently if we don't fundamentally know the material being recycled because the process changes. So Refibert is integrating the sorting and recycling components that are both needed for textile recycling to create a process that can convert discarded textiles into new 100% recycled thread. Now, to get into some of the specifics of that, our main secret sauce is actually we're rethinking the fundamental way that we recycle textiles today. Of the few examples that are available in industry, many of the sorting happens at the complete garment stage. So this is a complete shirt, 
or a complete coat that is then being sorted as to the best of our ability, which either could be manually or rather poorly autonomously. Now, this is a problem, again, because we talked about there can be multiple materials in one item. So how can you actually deal with that? A lot of what we're doing is we're actually integrating shredding into our sorting process, which allows us to get a finer granularity on precision and has caused our metrics to be very good about accurately being able to analyze material. After going through our sorting process, we're then able to go through our patent pending chemical recycling process to produce cellulosic and polyester based thread. Now these two materials alone account for over 93% of the textile waste stream. So refibrin has really developed a way that could have huge ramifications in how we think about textile waste. Now, in terms of our ask, so we are now working on the microfactory development of our lab scale technology, as was recently funded by our pre-seed round. However, what's very important for us right now is to get the right partnerships in industry who can support and validate the usefulness of our approach. This involves testing of our 100% recycled thread that is part of our process that we've developed, as well as we've actually seen that there's a potential for paper products, for example, fashion labels that could even be be produced through our same process. Additionally, there is a good argument to separate our sorting process to integrate with other recycling processes because there are many solutions that are coming out today. So, and even integration that shows that our sorting system is valuable is something that we're exploring as well. So thank you for your time. And please let me know if there's anything that you think we can work together on and really appreciate you supporting our mission. Thanks. Thank you, Refivered, for this great presentation. This is a snapshot of the other collaborations we have heard and helped connect over the past years. We hope that this encourages you to work with new startups as well. Startups may work in many different industries and, and talking to the startups is often the main way to understand what is really going on, going on behind the scenes. Not everything is on their website. There have been coalitions between different brands working with one startup. This helps promote the brands through the new sustainable startup as well. We would like to help you engage in that regard as there's so much potential in collaboration. I'd like to thank my colleague, Alexander Pine, who guided you through the rest of the value chain. And thank you uh, for letting us share what we're seeing in sustainable fashion space and spending the time with us going through the materials journey. We hope you enjoyed uh, and let us know if there's anything we might be able to help with. Please let us know again if you have any feedback or questions.